Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I have turned my phone on. Normally I keep my phone on mute, but today I have the ringer on because I can't miss a call. My, in the midst of all of this going on, my refrigerator went out. And so yesterday I had to go buy a refrigerator. The guy that's delivering the refrigerator is going to call me this morning. He may call me during this show. If you hear my phone ring, I'm going to stop the video so that I can answer the phone and then I'll restart it. Now, the best videos that I've ever done on YouTube are the ones that have an aha moment. In this video, I believe I've got at least, I know I've got one at the end that's going to be a, an aha moment, but I've got, a, there's another one more in the middle that I think is also a pretty aha moment. So this is going to be a good video, I believe. I believe this one is going to open a lot of your eyes out there. Okay. Now, first, we're going to start with something lighthearted from Jaquito McPhee. This is a tweet from Brad Garlinghouse yesterday. Oh, in Ripple's video staff meeting this morning, I'm practicing social distancing and turns out I'm really good at it. I've been doing it my whole life. It's called being a nerd. And that's David Schwartz in their uh, video staff meeting. Um, these are unprecedented times. Be kind to each other and embrace the moments of levity. I agree. Um, and look, to those of you out there who are, I mean, shoot, I was talking to my wife last night and she was a little freaked out. But to those of you out there, especially those of you that didn't go through the financial crisis, you're going through something right now that um, w no matter how bad it hurts or how scary it is, um, you're going through something that um, you'll come out of as a much stronger person. And so you need these types of experiences in, in life. From my experience, I can tell you for 100 percent sure, especially you young people out there, your financial lives will be lived completely different as a result of going through this than they would have been lived otherwise. I remember my, my grandmother went through the Great Depression and she was, she was always very frugal with her money and it served her well in life. And she was frugal because she remembered what the Great Depression was like when she had nothing. And another thing that, that these types of crises can, um, you know, another way that they can be good is that it, it, it creates an opportunity for you to become closer with your family and I mean, we're all right here in it. We're going to be close. We're going to be right there in close quarters and it'll give you an opportunity to spend more time with your family than you would otherwise. And so you, there, there's a lot of awful things having to do with this, but there's also a lot of good if you see it for what it is. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an eternal optimist. And so I don't ever look at the negative in any situation. I look at the bright, the, the silver lining and that's the, the best way to approach life, I mean, you're, you're, it does, whether it's this or something else, uh, my dad used to have on his desk um, in, in his office, it said, it was a quote, it said, life is one damn thing after another. And that is what life is. Um, but you have to, the, the seasoned of us out there, you have to learn that life's going to throw you curves and it's not fair. It's never fair. It's not fair that any of us are going through this right now. The sooner that you understand and accept that life is not fair, the better person you'll be and the more equipped for approach. Um, what are you going to be? Are you going to be the guy that sits on his hands and, and says, oh, well, this isn't fair and cry about it? Or are you going to be the person who does something about it and is proactive and, and works to protect himself and his family and, and thinks things through and plans uh, for things that are that could or might hit you? A lot of you will be much more better equipped going from here through your life because of something like this. Trust me on that, even though it doesn't feel like it now. Okay, I'm going to move move along from this. And I, now we're going to go down the road and I'm going to show you some things. And by the end of this, I promise you, you will be, you, you will be, your eyes will be wide open. Okay, 
This right here, now think about what's going on right now. This guy right here, this is the biggest thing I've seen in quite a while. But I just kind of showed it yesterday for a minute, but it's worth a whole video. Trust you, me. All right. Coinbase uh, chief uh, legal officer leaves to take senior role at U.S. bank regulator. This is a guy named uh, Coinbase uh, chief legal officer Brian Brooks is leaving the crypto exchange to become the second in command at the U.S. office of the controller of the currency. OK, he was appointed by Steve Mnuchin. Right. OK. Let's look. This is where the official announcement from the OCC.gov website. Um, let's see. The designation as the first deputy controller is made by Secretary, uh, Tre Secretary of the Treasury Stephen T. Mnuchin under his authority set forth here. Brian Brooks, this is from Stephen Mnuchin right here. Brian Brooks is a strong lead leader with extensive experience in the final financial services sector, said Treasury Secretary Steve T. Mnuchin. I look forward Stamp this in your minds, folks. I look forward to working with him to ensure the stability of our financial system and its ability to foster greater economic growth for the benefit of all Americans. And then uh, this is from Joseph Odding, who's the outgoing uh, guy in this position. Brian brings an extensive legal career, le uh, career of legal banking, financial innovation expertise to the industry, said comptroller of the currency, Joseph M. Odding. He's a visionary, well, maybe that may be the position above him. He is a visionary thinker with a passion for service and deep understanding of how the financial services industry supports our nation's prosperity. We are fortunate to attract such an experienced and talented individual to join the federal agency. Okay, now let's keep going, folks, because as I've said to you many times on this channel, everything, digital currencies, XRP, Ripple, Coinbase, everything having to do with digital assets and the creation of digital assets has to do with the financial crisis. The original, for those of you that are young, the financial crisis of 2008. Everything. Okay. All right. Cryptopolis, this jumped out at him too. Uh, so right in the middle of this current crisis, right in the middle of it, Coinbase Chief Legal Officer Brian Brooks picked for first deputy comptroller of the OCC. And, and Cryptopolis, who has 30 or 40 years in financial markets, this guy's smart, tons of experience, uh, actually broke bread with him in Las Vegas. Really good guy and really smart guy. This jumped out at him, too. I look forward to working with him to ensure the stability of our financial system, said Treasury Secretary Stephen T. Mnuchin. To ensure the stability of our financial system. OK, now let's take a look at this Brian Brooks, Chief Legal Officer Coinbase. This is not insignificant. Member Board of Directors of Fannie Mae, Chief Legal Officer of Coinbase. Um, as you go down here, there's a couple of random things I don't really know much about. Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for Fannie Mae. What, what, what was ground zero of the financial crisis? That was the global financial crisis of 2008, Fannie Mae. Right. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they were at ground zero of the financial crisis. Now, let's look at this. OK. And this right here. Vice Chairman, One West Bank, now CIT Bank. And he was the managing partner, of Washington, D.C. Office Chair Financial Services Practice Group of O. Melvany and Myers LLP. Well, let's go and look. Um, you know, there's a couple of things. I'll get to everything, but don't forget, don't forget Fannie Mae and don't forget that law group that he was a part of because it all ties in. Well, let's take a look at what what is the OCC, the founding of the OCC, where he just got a job appointed by Steve Mnuchin. Um, it's the founding of the OCC in the national banking system. President Lincoln recognized that that unreliable paper money and inadequate credit was problematic, along with his Treasury Secretary Solomon P. Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, 
He conceived the national banking system and the office of the comptroller of the currency to regulate and supervise it. On February 25th, 1863, President Lincoln signed the National Currency Act into law. The act established the office of the comptroller of the currency charged with the responsibility for organizing and administrating a system of nationally chartered banks and uniform national currency. In, in June 18. 64, the legislation underwent substantial amendment and became known as the National Bank Act, modified and supplemented over the years. The National Bank Act continues to provide the government governing framework for the national banking, uh, national banking system today. It's got pictures of currency. Through this act, Congress sought to achieve both short and long-term goals. One crucial objective was to generate cash desperately needed to finance the fight and fight the Civil War. After prospective national bank organizers submitted a business plan and had it approved by the OCC, they were required to purchase interest bearing U.S. government bonds in an amount equal. Da, da, da. All right, I'm not going to go through any more of that, but I think you kind of get the gist of what this um, entity, what this government arm was created for. Okay, this guy is the uh, the controller of the currency. So this is Brian Brooks's boss now, I'm assuming. All right. I want you to listen to. I got two video clips from him about what they're the things they're working on. This is called uh, highlights the value of innovation and fintech. Um, and I, you know, everybody recognizes the OCC's primary role is the safety and soundness of the U.S. banking system, but it but it is also that that consumers have access to that system and that they are treated fairly. And so when we look at you know a potential fintech getting a national banking charter, we would take it through those three particular lenses. And I do think where we're seeing really great utilization in fintech opportunities is really serving markets that don't have traditional banking relationships. And where we've seen especially opportunities is where in the inner cities across America, where you know there's less access to banking branches. Um, but most people, you know, there's a study that says, you know, so just under 70% of people of inner city America have a phone and they're already using the phone to buy things on Amazon and they're paying their <coughs> utility bills, that developing a banking relationship via that phone is a natural extension of that. And besides, you know, what I tell people, who wants to go stand in a line and cash a check anyway? You know what I mean, for as, a, as a using a bank. If you can do that, you know, pull your phone out, take a picture of your payroll check or have it directly deposited, um, those are features that are enhancing, I think, to the consumer's experience with financial services. And then the other aspect is it's very difficult on a, you know, a one-off for financial institutions to do small uh, dollar lending. But in a highly automated space, you can make that an efficient product to be able to deliver on a broad base for consumers. So I really think uh, in the fintech space of bringing what financial institutions, we're going to open up tremendously the markets and I think also consumer choices. So what he just described for you is how <laughs> he, the controller of the currency sees the banking system going to an app on your phone. I believe that this, like I just told you, Everything goes back to the financial crisis. I believe that, that these governments around the world had been working on digital currencies since before the financial crisis, but I believe the financial crisis was when they all looked at each other and said, this can't happen again. That's when everything was put in motion. I believe crypt digital assets is for the purpose of replacing the current banking system and bettering this to the point where all of us have apps on our phones and that is how money has moved around the world. Now, that goes hands in, in hand with everything Coinbase has been doing and everything Ripple has been doing, but that's not your aha moment. It's still, I've got two of them that are still coming because not only did this all hatch out of the financial crisis, but everything is connected. All of these companies are connected. All the powerful people are connected to Ripple and Coinbase. I'm going to show you. Watch. Here we go. But I'm going to show you one more video from the guy who is going to be Brian Brooks's boss right here. Of that Joseph work Audi. has been the OCC FinTech Charter. Um, By the way, don't forget his name either, Joseph Otty. Okay. I just got my, here's the phone ringing about my refrigerator delivery. So I'm going to stop this and start it back. Okay. I hope I'm recording again that the refrigerator man is on his way, so I'll probably have to stop this video again. But nothing is going to stop us from getting our two aha moments. So here we go. 
Um, uh, you recently announced that you would be going forward, the agent uh, would be going forward and thinking <coughs> through and implementing that uh, charter. What was your thinking process uh, like? Uh, what led you to that decision and what can we expect to see in the immediate term? Sure. Um, well, under Comptroller Curry, as Chris mentioned, uh, in this very room, uh, Comptroller Cur uh, Curry announced that he was going to pursue the OCC's ability to issue what they call a special charter um, under the national banking system. And when Comptroller Currency, uh, Curry first brought that uh, issue to the forefront, there were probably hundreds and hundreds of companies that thought they wanted to be a bank. Um, and as those particular companies came into the OCC and learned what it took to be a bank, um, it, they realized it's incredibly complicated to be a financial institution. You know, bankers talk with their regulators about things like capital and liquidity and risk management and policies and procedures and infrastructure. And when you think of most fintech companies, you couldn't be more, you know, on the other side of the horizon, so to speak, where they are time to market, solving solutions, you know, bringing, bringing um, opportunities uh, to both consumers and businesses, um, disruption. And so what we've kind of learned over the last couple years is there, there are a lot of companies that have the ability to offer solutions for consumers and businesses, but they don't necessarily have the infrastructure and processes to be a financial institution. And so of those hundreds and hundreds, the trend that we see now is most of the discussions that are occurring with the agency is how do we partner with the bank? How do we bolt on to a bank system? How do, what, what kind of requirements would a bank want from us as a vendor to be able to provide assistance? And when you think about the fintechs, um, you know, they kind of fall into three buckets as we observe them. One, they show how to underwrite credit, whether it's consumer or small businesses, in a faster, more efficient manner. Um, second of all, they generally um, uh, introduce ways for um, banks to interact with their customers, meaning how they have dialogue through mobile devices with their customers. And then the third is, is how to attract new customers. In other words, how can they effectively and efficiently show a bank that they can reach more new potential customers. And so what we've seen now is fintech companies are really starting to say, we have these great resources, we have these great tools that we can deploy in the financial services industry, and so how do we align with that? Now, that's a big population. We still have a significant population of entities that are saying, we want to be a bank. Um, we see the advantages of the interstate banking where we can deliver products and services into you know, Dallas and Miami and New York and Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles, and we need a common platform with rules and regulations to be able to do that. And so we have a number of institutions that are now progressing through the process um, of going through the documentation and submitting and having application uh, discussions about actually filing for a charter to be a bank. And it is our expectation either later this year or the first part of next year, we will see our first application to be a national banking charter. A key. So what, what I got out of that is that, that he, he talked about a common platform. I think common app platform. All right. Now, don't worry, your aha moment is coming, and this still is not it, but this is kind of a mini aha moment. But when they were, when they were talking about, um, about um, he's talking about people in fintech trying to get banking charters, this is one of the clips that popped in my mind. Remember when Miguel Baez was talking about becoming a lender of last resort? And the company is, um, it's amazing what it's been able to achieve. Um, incredibly solid. Our, our leadership is amazing. And um, I think we're, we're on a, a path that hopefully we'll all look back someday and be like, wow, I can't believe I was a part of that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm obviously pretty stoked. Like, how do you intend to distribute the rest of, rest of the XRP then? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question, Mahir. And I, I don't necessarily know that we'll ever distribute all of it. In my mind's eye, there's a possibility where you know, we end up more of a lending kind of, uh, you know, a more of a lending lender of last resort capacity, maybe. Uh, I think that would be a little strange for a software company and maybe some things would have to, to change structurally. Maybe we have to have a different organization or something. Who knows, right? Um, yeah, who knows? A different organization or something. Um, and then <laughs> Ian Northing weighed in on this and cussed a little bit, but then he says, he, he's, he's tweeting out this about the appointment of this Brian Brooks. So we're kind of getting back to Brian Brooks. 
And remember, Treasury, Sec Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin is the guy that appointed Brian Brooks. Now, um, he says, brace yourself up. He says, that straight up connects everything. I mean, everything. Ripple, Barry Silver, DCG, Grayscale, brace yourselves. And then he's talking about the appointment of Brian Brooks. Now, let's go and look. Um, this was when Brian Brooks became Coinbase's new chief legal officer. This was the announcement from Brian Armstrong, who started Coinbase. So let's go down and look underneath this picture here. This is Brian Brooks. That's Brian um, Armstrong. And I believe this is their CEO. I can't remember his name. Listen to this. Brian most recently served as an executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary of Fannie Mae, the nation's largest financial institution. He led the company's 200-person legal department and government relations group and acted as a senior advisor to the CEO and board of directors. Prior to Fannie Mae, Brian led the legal department at One West Bank, a regional depository institution that he helped sell to CIT Group. Brian also played a key role in managing the bank's senior regulatory relationships. Brian joined One West in 2011 from O. Melvaney, remember the law firm? O'Melveny and Myers LLP, where he served as a managing partner of the firm's 150 lawyer Washington, D.C. office, chair of the firm's 40 lawyer National Financial Services Practice Group, and member of the firm's three partner executive committee at O'Melveny. Brian was involved in many of the most important financial services policy issues of the past decade, including representing former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and other clients before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. So you got this guy with this major profile who thinks, just like Miguel Valle, remember Miguel Valle has left the CME group. This guy thought it was a good idea to leave the CME group to go to this random startup called Ripple and head the XRP markets of this digital asset, which could, quote, become called a security, in which case he's been selling it. He's committed crimes, not going to happen. I've made that point several times. So now you got this guy who's an attorney, who's the general counsel at the largest financial institution, Fannie Mae, which is government created, right? And thinks it's a good idea to leave that to go to some cryptocurrency firm, firm named Coinbase. Well, I draw your attention to this. Prior to Fannie Mae, Brian led the legal department at One West Bank a regional depository institution that helped sell to CIT Group. Brian also played a key role in managing the bank, the bank's senior regulatory relationships. I sa I've said to you in the past, folks, Miguel Valles does not leave the CME Group. Remember, CME Group bought into Ripple the year before Miguel Valles leaves to run the XRP market. And I've said to you before on this channel, he, a guy like that with that pedigree does not leave the CME group to go to some startup in San Francisco, even if he's still working out of New York, does not do that without the proper assurances from people on high that assure him that, hey, this thing is called a security. I'm not in trouble. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. This guy doesn't go to Coinbase without the proper assurances. Well, what kind of assurances could these type of guys get? Well, I'll call your attention right back to this. Uh, he, he, um, prior to Fannie, he led the legal department at One West Bank, a regional depository institution that helped sell this to the CIT group. Does anybody remember when we went over this? This is Steve Mnuchin, the guy that just appointed this Brian guy to be the deputy of the whatever, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the position. But anyway, you know the point. All right, my refrigerator is here, and so I will pick up on this point right after I help these guys get going. Um, they're driving up right now. Okay, I've got the refrigerator, guys. If you hear any bumping and stuff like that, it's because they are, they're having to take apart my old refrigerator, get it out, and then probably take apart the new one and take it in. And so that will be the noises you're hearing. But in the meantime, we're, we're talking about something financially that changes the entire world. And I am showing you right here, your aha moments are starting now. Now, remember, we just went over that uh, Brian Brooks was, was uh, he led the legal department at One West Bank, uh, uh, this depository institution that helped sell the CIT group. Well, that when I read that, that reminded me, Steve Mnuchin, during the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, 
Mnuchin bought failed residential lender Indy Mac. He changed the name to One West Bank and rebuilt the bank, then sold it to CIT Group in 2015. During his time as One West CEO and chairman, the bank became embroiled in several lawsuits. And then you go down here to the bottom down here, sale to CIT. In 2015, Mnuchin sold One West to CIT Group for $3.4 billion. After the acquisition of CIT, he remained at One West and became a member of CIT Group's board of directors. On uh, August 2016, Mnuchin owned $97 million in the stock. Da, 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 da. Um, and then he left. He resigned in 2016 from the board of directors of CIT, um, and he to go. He went to become the Treasury Secretary. Now, just so you know, this is the comp. This is the current comp trolling the, the video that I just showed you, um, and then this is this Brian. Um, uh, I keep all these Brian's. I keep getting their Brian Brooks. This is Brian Brooks when, who helped them sell One West Bank to CIT, making Steve Mnuchin a mega millionaire, I guess. And this, if he wasn't already, probably was already, he started with Goldman Sachs. Um, but this is Brian Brooks that just left Coinbase to go to, um, the, to be the deputy of the comptroller, which is this guy. Okay. Both of them worked at one west bank with steven mnuchin okay so there's that now here's the other thing did you do you remember this stuart alderati guess where he left to come to ripple to be ripple's number one lawyer their general counsel mr alderati brings more than 30 years of legal experience to the role with expertise in banking and regulatory affairs he is joining ripple from leading financial institution CIT, where he served as executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary, and was, and was responsible for all legal, corporate governance, and insurance risk management matters. All right, let's keep going. So, <laughs> um, Ian Northing had, had said this all ties together. So you got you got the digital currency group, Barry Silbert's on the digital currency group. You got Glenn Hutchins, who's with the New York Federal Reserve on that board. Um, and remember, the digital currency group was one of the, ori or the original owners in coin or original investors in Coinbase and in Ripple. OK, they were two of the first, almost as if this was all planned. Um, if you go down, board of advisors, Lawrence Summers. Lawrence Summers is one of the board of advisors. Now, who's Lawrence Summers? Lawrence Summers, um, he's an American economist, former vice president of Development of Economics and Chief Economist at the World Bank, senior U.S. Treasury Department official throughout President Clinton's administration. You think this guy knows Steve Mnuchin? You think he knows? Look, he was also former director of Na the National Economic Council for President Obama. He's former president of Harvard University. This guy's this guy's resume is, I mean, extremely extensive. He served in the Clinton administration. Uh, was the president of Harvard. This guy is connected out the wazoo. He just happens to be on the board at the company that was one of the original investors in both Ripple and Coinbase. And then there's this. Uh, remember this guy on Ripple's board, Gene Sperling? He also uh, served as a National Economic Council director. He was there right around. He was in these administrations. He was under President Clinton. And then he was also under President Obama. You think these guys rubbed any shoulders? You think these guys know each other? Larry Summers and... Gene Sperling, everything's connected, folks. That's right. All of this goes very to the very top of the United States structure, and all of it, sorry, and all of it goes leads back to the financial crisis. They had to fix this problem. All right. Next, I'm gonna now I'm gonna blow your mind a little further. First, I'm gonna show this is this is a um th th this right here is where this gets really interesting, folks. Okay, this is. What I, the first aha moment would be this Brian Brooks and how he ties in with Steve Mnuchin and, and, and how the Ripple General Counsel also ties to Steve Mnuchin. But here's where it gets really interesting. Now, this first clip I'm going to show you is just where he talks about XRP. It's not really relevant to what I'm talking about here, but I'm going to show you the part. I'm going to go back to the beginning of this video after I show you this little clip and and I want you to hear from Brian Brooks how he got into crypto. That's what's interesting. But first, he mentioned XRP, so I felt like I at least needed to 
let you hear this um, from th 3645 here. Now, this for you, so you know, this is with Masori, who we don't necessarily like. They're very anti ripple or whatever, but that's not really relevant to this. 3645, uh, Brian Brooks is talking, of, he brings up XRP. Point. Um, mm -hmm. So, too, it, it, you know, if you take things like uh, XRP, which um, which we list obviously, but when XRP did their MoneyGram deal and suddenly had real global distribution and a significantly different utility case than it might have, you know, two years ago, say, that's relevant to our assessment of its of its utility. And so, those, so some of its events are even, you know, we may read something in the newspaper that will cause us to go back on a on a more urgent basis, and if not, we'll capture it as part of the periodic cycle. Okay, that was just him mentioning XRP. I wanted you to hear, but that's not what's important. Let me take you back to 125. Now, I'm going to play you a, a solid um, a solid four and a half minutes or so, and, and or something in that range. And it's, it's important that you understand. This guy's a genius, first of all. He's a very smart guy. But when, while you're listening to this, I want you to remember you don't get got you don't get the quality of talent the the people at Ripple the people at Coinbase these are people that are top notch these are people that are that are Ivy Leaguers these are people that are connected all the way to the heights of government okay those kind of people don't just leave and go to some startup okay listen to what this guy says and then I'm going to close this out with a really good aha moment for you okay listen up. Um, what was that process like and, and over what time frame did, did this uh, transition happen for you? Well, Ryan, first of all, thanks very much for having me. This is a great, uh, great program you have and it's exciting. By the way, he's talking about what led him to Coinbase and how he got involved in crypto, why it interested him. To connect with your listeners, I really appreciate being included. I think, uh, you know, on the origin story bit, rather than just giving you a reverse summary of my resume, uh, I can I can really give you a deep origin story because I've... I think kind of been destined for this for a long, long time. And, and so what I tell you is if, if you go back 15 years or more in my career, uh, a lot of what I've done as a lawyer was uh, sort of trying to figure out and fix what's broken with the financial system. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are several early things that I think kind of pointed me in this direction. So one example I think about is years and years ago, this, this had to be more than 15 years ago. I was on the board of a nonprofit called Appleseed. We had a, a program at Appleseed called the Financial Inclusion Program. And uh, one of the things we were trying to solve at that time was the, the problem that something like 10 million Americans receive their tax refunds in the form of a check from the government. And these people didn't have bank accounts. So in order to get their tax refund, they had to go to a check casher and pay fees that were 5 or 10% of the check amount just for the privilege mm -hmm. of getting their own tax money back. And so we had a program at Appleseed where we worked with the IRS to aggregate uh, a whole bunch of tax refunds together and then go to banks and say, look, you might not want to bank these people individually because, um, you know, they don't have the minimum balance on an individual basis. But what if we gave you a million new accounts, each of which had $400 in it? Would you then waive the fees? And when we did that, there was a bank that was willing to do that. And we got the IRS to issue direct deposits into this bank and uh, basically give these, and the bank then agreed to give these people debit cards and a free checking account. That really puzzled me why a bank would not want the individual account holders, but was willing to have all of the account holders. It told me something about the way the banking system worked. You know, the idea that many people are excluded from that kind of financial service that you and I take for granted. So that was an early, early insight of mine into there, there's something wrong here, you know, that, that ought to be fixable. If you fast forward a few years, I had some really interesting experiences in the financial crisis. Um, one of them was I had sort of a celebrity client at that time, Alan Greenspan, who was the immediate former chairman of the Federal Reserve, one of the longest serving Fed chairs ever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he was called to testify before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to talk about what happened. And, uh, you know, was it, was it his fault as Fed chair that he kept interest rates low for too long? He had a really interesting story about that, which was, no, actually, it's not that we kept rates low. We, we raised rates every quarter for four years before the financial crisis started. What it was was, is that global capital markets had sufficiently changed that the Fed could no longer control mortgage rates, right? And that had to do with the fact that Chinese investors who, you know, had come online and at scale right around that time were investing in American mortgage securities as a high yielding but safe asset. 
And so that told me there was something else broken. You know, the ability of regulators to control money flows wasn't what we thought it used to be. Then I left my law firm and I went with Stephen Mnuchin and Joseph Odding to buy a series of failed banks in Southern California led by IndyMac Bank, one of the biggest bank failures in the crisis. And if you wanted to see something that was broken, you know, IndyMac was a great example of what was wrong with concentration risk and finance. So my point is, I had a whole series of experiences over a long period of time that told me there's something wrong with the system. Can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Then fast forward to 2017 and 18, and a former colleague of mine had come to Coinbase as the chief financial officer. And she clued me into the idea that one of the things that might be wrong with the system was its focus on central intermediaries. That when you concentrate all money flows through a small number of large banks, you get all kinds of risks created. First of all, you get the risk that they will choose not to bank the little guy. You know, that's the problem of the small checking account balance that I learned at Appleseed. And then mm -hmm. second, you'll get them chasing profits um, in a way that concentrates risk in a small number of institutions, which means that when they fail, they fail big. Um, and then you have this issue of global capital flows. This was kind of the Chinese issue that Alan Greenspan was talking about at the time. And her thesis was crypto may be the answer to these things. Crypto solves the problem of central intermediaries running our financial system, much the same way that email and other kinds of distributed communication technologies solved the problem of the post office back in the day. And that was an insight I had not thought of, but I did know what was broken. And so I came to Coinbase because I saw Coinbase as the platform company trying to bring to market all of these projects that are going to fix that. And that's what I'm doing here. So my question is, did he come to Coinbase or was he placed at Coinbase <laughs> when I see all this stuff? Now, that is a real eye opener in itself. But now, what I decided to do is take it a step further just to see if I could find any kind of a connection. So I typed in Brian Brooks and Brad Garlinghouse into Google, and it led me to a tweet by Brad Garlinghouse. This is a tweet from December 18th, 2018. Blockchain, he's quoting this article that I'm about to read to you. Blockchain could prove to be as important to commerce as email and text messaging were to communications. The new financial systems built on it could help connect people around the world who lack access to traditional banking services. And this article is from the New York Times. I don't often read you entire articles, but I'm about to read this one because do you know who wrote it? And do you know what the title is? Well, Brian Brooks wrote this on December 18th of 2018. And the title of the article in the New York Times deal book is America could lead the transition to a digital currency reserve. Here, and I'm going to read you the article now because you need to hear the whole thing. After spending decades as the dominant global reserve currency, the dollar's position is being challenged. The greenback's share of global central bank reserves has declined in nine of the past 10 quarters. The International Monetary Fund reported in September. The slide is hardly new. It began a decade ago when European leaders attempted to replace the dollar with their euro based basket of currencies as the common global reserve. But the United States should not fight against the forces of globalization that challenge the dollar's reserve currency status. Instead, it must seize the opportunity to incubate technologies that will enable future digital currencies, which could go on to power a transnational currency or supranational currency perhaps the best next option for a future global reserve. Committing to this course would provide a check on attempts to supplant the dollar's role in the global financial system with other sovereign currencies. It would also put the United States at the heart of a more open and equitable financial system. There are lessons in America's technology, technological history that should inform future policy relating to, the digi to digital currencies. More than three decades ago, the United States government supported the development of the Internet. Doing so unleashed huge economic impact on America that can still be seen today in the successes of the nation's biggest techn technology companies. The digital financial revolution that the world is on the cusp of has the potential to be just as significant for job creation and economic development. Blockchain, the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies, could prove to be as important to commerce as email and text messaging word of communications. New financial systems built on it could help connect people around the world who lack access to traditional banking services. 
and these innovations could be leveraged by developers in much the same way as entrepreneurs built web services on the internet from eBay to Facebook with the same enormous impact on the American economy. That is, if we see the opportunity that is before us, countries around the world are racing to lead the next revolution in financial technology. While it is clear that the United States and companies like Coinbase were early entrants in this global movement, it is also true that many nations and individuals are jockeying for leadership. There are currently more than 1,400 digital currencies and tokens available, serving a variety of uses. Central banks from China to Sweden to Uruguay are considering issuing their own. America must maintain its leadership role by leading the way on research and development of cryptocurrency technologies, just as it did in the early days of the internet, rather than stifling it. And if it does, it could lead ultimately, it could ultimately build dominant cryptocurrency technologies that become the backbone of the, tw of the 21st century financial system. Doing so, could yield all sorts of wonderful possibilities. In the 21st century, when a national market undergoes a major fluctuation, America could enable an alternative currency. It could make it easier for American farmers to sell foreign customers without the friction of foreign exchange. And its development agencies like USAID could airdrop cryptocurrencies to hard hit regions of the world that lack ac access to banking infrastructure. That dollar is under pressure as the world's reserve currency should only lend more urgency to the endeavor, as America should not come to rely on global cryptocurrency technologies that have been developed by other nations. The United States can retain its leadership role in the global financial system, but only if it nurtures the development of the technologies that will underpin its future. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that Brian Brooks wrote an article in the New York Times in 2018 called America Could Lead the Transition to a Digital Currency Reserve. And now he has, be, has been appointed by Steve Mnuchin, our Treasury Secretary, uh, to that position as, well, if I can remember the name of it. <laughs> um, anyway, I dropped the article, but the I keep forgetting the name of this organization, but it's the Comptroller of the Currency. He's the deputy now. You can't make this stuff up, folks, and it's all tied together. It's all connected, and it has everything to do with saving a financial system that was done, cooked. Thank you for listening.